Paula White uh, on her mm, television program uh, has recently, um, well, done a teaching regarding the importance of breaking generational curses. Now, this is a recurring doctrine and theme that you hear in the Word of Faith camp. If you're familiar with televangelists and the Word of Faith heresy, um, there, you know, Paula White's not the only person that teaches this particular doctrine. But when you take the time to actually pull out your Bible and look at the underpinning concepts that they have behind this, um, well, um, what you find is, is that th- there's something really missing, and that thing that's missing is lucid, in-context, Bible exegesis. And so without any further ado, here is Paula White to explain how you can authoritatively pray to break curses and bring about blessings in your life. No joke. Um, Here's Paula White. Welcome to the program today. As we're in this holiday season, I know that you're thinking about the gifts, the trees, the presents, the budget, the food, all the other things. But I want you to recognize that God gave us the greatest gift, His Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus gave His mission statement in John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. Yeah, okay. That word- yeah, okay, got to stop right there. Okay, now I do not have time to unpack this again. This is kind of a recurring teaching that we have to do here at Fighting for the Faith. All those people out there who are basically trying to make the claim that, oh, G- you know, Jesus is mission statement. He's come to give you life And life abundantly. Well, when you put that verse back in context, it doesn't actually say that. And what I've done, in fact, hang on a second here, abundant. There it is. Okay. There, if you're, if you've been following us, then you know that we've recently put up a YouTube channel, a YouTube channel. You can find it at youtube.com forward slash fighting the number four, the faith. Yeah. YouTube.com forward slash fighting fighting the number four, the faith, all squished together. And we have in our YouTube channel in a uh, video entitled Abundant Life? Question mark. Rightly understanding John chapter 10, verse 10. Rightly understanding John chapter 10, verse 10. So I, if you have questions about how to rightly understand this verse and figure out how she's twisting it, go to that uh, to that resource available on our YouTube channel and you can listen and go oh now i understand why you know why how how and why people are messing that up but i don't i don't want to spend my time on that because we've done that recently but let's continue the word literally means i've come to give you a life that is superior in quality i want you to think for a moment is your life superior in quality Super- <laughs> okay, now I'm going to point something out here. We'll do a little deconstructing work here. That question is is like the question that Satan asked Eve in the Garden of Eden. It is a deconstructing question, and here's the, the purpose of it. Okay, she number one, she's cited John 10.10 10 out of context and hasn't rightly taught us what it says. Okay, number two, now she says, oh, the word abundant here is, it means to have an you know, exceedingly great quality of life or whatever, right? That's what apparently Jesus is. So here's the question. Are you experiencing a life of superior quality? And you sit there and go, hmm, no, I'm not. Well, see, that is designed. The reason why people like Paula ask a question like that is because, well, see, that's designed to cause you to distrust your pastor and to trust her. And here's how the logic goes. Well, my pastor never told me that I'm supposed to have a superior quality life. Huh. Why hasn't he told me this? Well, here Paula is telling me about this. So I'm not going to trust my pastor, but I'm going to trust uh, Paula. Okay. Pastrix Paula. Despite the fact that Pastrix Paula is not supposed to be a Pastrix, right? Okay. So, I mean, already you should have be having red flags. This is a deconstructing question cause, that's designed to cause you to distrust your real pastor and to trust her because Paul is going to level with you. She's going to give you the information that your pastor hasn't been telling you. We continue. Do you have a quality life? Because salvation is much more than just simply going to heaven. God wants to get some heaven here to you on earth. Okay. What verses say that in context, by the way? But the reality is there is something that many of us have to deal with. It's generational blessings and generational cursings. No, really? Gasp. I had no idea. 
to deal with generational cursings and blessings? My pastor never told me about this. Jesus Christ came and became a curse that we might receive blessing. So the greatest gift... So close. I mean, yeah, I mean, yes, Jesus Christ became a curse because cursed is everyone who was hung on a tree. Um, but boy, yes, yeah, now she's citing, you know, like verses you know, without citing them. OK, this is not good. Gift was that God gave us his son and that we would no longer be a victim under the curse of the law, that we would be redeemed, that we could be free from all of the cycles that had been passed down and legally in the spirit had to be recurring because the Bible says up to three or four generations that there are curses that the sins of our forefathers will be passed down unless somebody knows how to break it. Oh, uh, wait a second. Okay, did, hang on a sec. I got to back this up because details matter. Now, let me kind of, again, we're going to slow things down a little bit here. Pay close attention to what she's doing. She's not actually exegeting. She's claiming to make reference to something that's taught in the Bible, right? But she hasn't actually read the passage and then if you're familiar with the passage at all that she's sort of referencing, she's adding to it. Remember our addition and subscri- uh, subtraction episode of Fighting for the Faith. Bible twisters add to and subtract from the scripture in order to teach their doctrine and their theology, not to teach what the scriptures say. So let me back this up just enough so that you can hear this and see if you can spot the addition to scripture. Okay, now this requires you to actually know what the passage says, but don't worry, we'll we'll get it to you so that you can actually hear it. But she adds something to the scripture. Okay, let me back this up. Here we go. We'll add about 20 seconds. Hit, hit, listen again. Because the Bible says up to three or four generations that there are curses that the sins of our forefathers will be passed down unless somebody knows how to break it. Okay. The, the addition, by the way, was the phrase, unless somebody knows how to break it, okay? Let's pull out our Bibles and take a look at this, the, the passage that she's sort of referencing. Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20, this is where the Ten Commandments are found. We're going to look at verse 8, and the, uh, not verse 8, we're going to start at verse 5. We're going to take a look at this in context, and then we'll even look at a cross-reference in the book of Deuteronomy. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, pay close attention here. Um, here's what it says, You shall not bow down to them, talking about false gods, or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Okay, notice here that um, nothing here about somebody needs to know how to break the generational curse. Okay, no no reference to somebody, oh, you got to know how to break it. Yeah, no, that's not there in the text at all. And let's take a look at um, Deuteronomy chapter 5. Let me add a little context here, see if we can grab verse 8. Um, here's what it says, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 8. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So this, these are the two passages, the primary passages that talk about um, you know, God visiting iniquity on you know, people who hate him and stuff like that. And these form the basis for the so-called teaching of generational curses. But you, again, you'll find out what's missing there it is the thing that Patricia King, uh, not Patricia King, uh, Paula White added. Okay, let me back it up again so you can hear it, her, hear her say it. Listen again. Generations, that there are curses that the sins of our forefathers will be passed down unless somebody knows how to break it. So the sins of our forefathers will be passed down unless somebody knows how to break it. Nope, no passage says that at all. But it seems logical, doesn't it? I mean, well, if there's a generational curse, I mean, doesn't it seem plausible that somebody needs to know how to break those curses? The problem is, is that if God wanted you to break those curses, there would be a section in the scripture that says generational curses, how to break them. 
pretty straightforward, but there's no such passage. We continue. So let's get into the Word. Let's see what the Bible has to say, because I don't want you going into 2013 or into next year carrying the same baggage. If Christ came to set you free and bring you blessing, then let's get in position and see how we can release the goodness of God in our life. And get in position and release the goodness of God in our life? What are you talking about? Get in position? So, you know, but isn't this really nice of her? I mean, she's, she is so kind. She's just thinking about you. I mean, you, she doesn't want you going into 2013 with one of these generational curses, you know, hanging on your back like you know, a bunch of unwanted baggage. She just wants you to know how to break this curse. Oh, that's so kind of her. In John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, those who have been born again through receiving Jesus, that God has given them the right to become the children of God. The Greek word right literally means exousia. It means authority. Exousia. Um, yeah, okay. Um, he, he, yes. The, the, the John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13, you know, those who believe in God has given the right to become children of God. And yes, the word right is the Greek word exousia, correct. But watch what she does here. Okay, now this, she is really good at her Bible twisting. I mean, she has got this down to a science. What she's going to, what she's done is she's quoted a passage where it says that in Scripture we have the right to become children of God. She's made reference to the Greek, but watch what she does. She's going to add more information that isn't in this passage at all. Let me back it up so you can hear. She's going to be adding things to this this concept of exousia. Here we go. God, the Greek word right literally means exousia. It means authority. So God has given you who are born again, who have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, the authority as a child of God. Now what you have to recognize. No, no, no. He's given me the authority to be a child of God. Grammar matters here. Okay. He's given us the authority to be or become children of God. She's changed it ever so slightly, okay? Listen again. Boy, man, she is just slippery. She's like mercury on a, you know, on a formica table. Hey, let's listen again as she adds to this concept. Here we go. On Jesus Christ, the authority as a child of God. The authority as a child of God. See, that's, that's key. She took it from the authority to be to the authority as two completely different ideas. And the one, the authority to be, the right to be, is what's found in that text. The authority as, that's something that's not in this text. And just, I'm telling with her, it just, oh, a single word makes the difference because she's already at this point, she's already twisted this text even though she's creating the impression that what she's teaching is biblical. Now, what you have to recognize is you have authority. It has been given to you. Yeah, I have the authority, the right to be a child of God. So with that authority, you have to exercise it because every day, and you're going to find out that the... I have to exercise my authority? The main vehicle for blessings or cursings is words. Where does this say this in the Bible? The main vehicle for blessings and cursings is words. I'm not familiar with that verse in context. So now she's, okay, so she changed it from the authority to be the children of God to the authority as, and you need to now exercise that authority through words. This is not what John chapter 1 verses 12 through 13 says. Hmm. Every day, what words you speak because you have been given authority Either heaven is coming in agreement with you or hell is coming in agreement with you. Really, do you have a Bible verse that says that? I'm not familiar with any passage that says any such nonsense. So authority is effective only if it is exercised. The potential of the new birth or salvation is unlimited. But the actual results depend on the exercise of the authority that each one... Yeah, are you exercising your authority? I mean, do you take your authority out for a walk every day and exercise it? Again, what Bible verse actually says this? All she did was say the Greek word for right there, where you have the right to become a children of God, is the Greek word exousia. She mispronounced it. And then because it's the word authority, that means, ergo, that you have to speak words and, and you know exercise your authority. 
that doesn't mean that at all. One of us as children of God, as born again believers, exercise in our life. What you will become or see released in your life is determined to the extent by the exercise of your God-given authority. Again, Bible verses that say that, what good comes into my life will be determined by, you know, to the degree by the things I exercise regarding the authority. I mean, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong here, but isn't Tiger Woods like a, still a very wealthy man? I mean, yeah, I understand that half of his <clears throat> stuff had to go to uh, his ex-wife. Um, that was kind of a messy situation. But uh, last time I checked, Tiger Woods still flies in private jets. He still makes a truckload of money on, you know, out on the tour. And I mean, he's a very, and he's a Buddhist. Um, how did he become so wealthy? I mean, based on this magical principle that you're giving here, people like Tiger Woods should be paupers. And, well, Christians who exercise their God-given child authority, or the authority as children, not to be children, they should be, they're the, they're the ones who should be out there, you know, rolling in the dough, right? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, it doesn't pan out in real, in real life or anything. This is, this is just, well, this is a teaching to scratch itching ears to make you think that, oh, listen, there's these secret principles that Paul is going to tell you that your pastor isn't going to tell you. I mean, has your pastor told you about, you know, having a superior quality of life? I bet he hasn't. Well, Paul is going to tell you about it. See, she's going to tell you the Greek word is for, for authority is exousia. And that means you have to exercise your authority. And when you do that, <gasps> you're going to come in agreement with heaven and, and heaven's going to open up. And then Patricia King's going to show up with a big increase check for you. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. And if you believe this, I have magic beans that I'd like to sell you. In other words, the decisions you make, how you take the word and work the word, what you do with the... Work the word. That's what witches do with spells. They work those words. Yeah, this is witchcraft. Price that Jesus Christ paid. The Bible declares in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I, God, have set before you life and death. Uh, <clears throat> boy, boy, we're going to have to spend some time in context. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Hold on a second here. I'm going to pull this up in my computerized Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 30. By the way, again, just to review, um, our three primary rules for sound biblical exegesis are context, context, and context. And here's the fun part. 90 to 95 percent of all Bible twisting just gets cleared up like that. It just all you got to do is apply a little bit of context. You know how, like, you know, if you have a rash, you put cortisone on it and it just clears it right up. Context is like cortisone, it just clears up a good heretical rash just like that. And so, we're going to put some context on Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Now, the way she just taught it, you'd think that Deuteronomy chapter 13 is. God saying, listen, you need to exercise your authority, dog. Make sure you take him out on the leash and, you know, make sure that he's got, you know, he's been run for the day so that you can have heaven come in alignment with you so that you, yeah, <clears throat> that's not what it's saying at all. Okay, <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 30, I will begin. Let's see here. How much context do I want to add? Verse 11, <clears throat> for this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us to bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart, so that you can do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But... If you turn your hearts away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life 
that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord your, uh, Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give to them. <clears throat> so, um, anything here about exercising your authority with words and having have it? No, nothing here. Because what is this? This, folks, is the blessing and cursing portion of the Mosaic Covenant. This is not the covenant that we Christians are under, by the way. Okay, you, in fact, you need to do some good work on the, you know understanding the difference between the Abrahamic Covenant and the Mosaic Covenant, or the New Covenant versus the Old Covenant. This is a covenant of works under the Mosaic Covenant, and the this is you know laying out the the blessings and the curses portion of the covenant. You don't follow these things, bad things are going to happen to you, okay? And bad things to happen to the people of Israel. They broke this covenant left, right, and sideways, and diagonally, and horizontally, and any which way you can possibly think of, they found ways of breaking this covenant. God finally had enough and exercised his legal right to basically banish them from the land and send them into exile, right? That's what, what goes on here. So, um, she's now quoting a portion from the blessing and cursing portion of the Mosaic Covenant, which we as Christians are not under, and somehow turning this into a magic spell that this is this is a portion of Scripture that teaches you that you need to exercise your authority with your words. But it doesn't say that at all. Blessing and cursing, and therefore choose life or exercise your authority for the life that is set before you. That's not what this passage says. I just read it in context. It doesn't say that at all. That both you and your seed may live. This is about generations to come. Things need to be broken over your life. Habitual sins, cycles. Every woman gets pregnant out of wedlock. Every person is abused. Everybody goes through a divorce. Everyone's an alcoholic. Everybody has a certain kind of addiction. Everybody suffers depression. Those things... Who says these things? Things can be broken by the blood of Jesus and through the word of God. Teach me, Pastor Paula. Show me how. See, here, here it's very clear. The provision that we're going to focus on is the exchange from cursing to blessing. The alternatives are clear. Life is set before you. And death is set before you. Life is the blessings of God. Death is cursing. And it says, you choose this day. Although life and blessing have been provided, the choice is yours which you will live in. And I often say it's not that we're doing something wrong. It's that we're not doing enough of what it's right. Uh, <laughs> good night. I mean, she even has built a theology off of her misquoted passage of scripture from Deuteronomy here. This is completely biblically absurd. The Bible says that my people perish because of lack of knowledge. It's what we don't know. <clears throat> context, context, context. By the way, she was just quoting there from the uh, prophet Hosea. Hosea, let me pull this up on my computerized Bible. Hosea chapter 4. Man, we've been doing a lot of context today. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, let's put some context around this, find out what's going on here, and see if this is basically saying what Paula White just said that it's saying, but she didn't really quote it in context. <clears throat> Hosea, Hosea 4, 1. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love. And no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, committing adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore, the land mourns and all who dwell in it languish. And all the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens, even the fish of the sea are taken away. <clears throat> wow. All of that because people are disobeying God. They're engaging in wickedness and evil. Yet, let no one contend and let none accuse for with you is my contention, O priest, you shall stumble by day, and the prophets shall stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because they have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being a priest to me, and since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Mm -hmm. See, the lack of knowledge here is a direct lack of knowledge of the revealed written word of God and his laws. That's what's being referred to here. Not that you're destroyed for lack of knowledge, for not for failing to exercise your exousia so that you can break generational curses. 
Boy, she is a slick teacher. Slick, slick twister of God's word. We continue. That can be killing us or causing us, even though we love God with all of our heart, to walk out under that curse. He reminded them this choice not only affects you, but it also affects your descendants, your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren, those. Yes, we don't want your grandchildren cursed because you forgot to exercise your exousia. In your lineage and your legacy, long after you're gone, he said, choose this day for you and your seed. So it continues from generation to generation. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Have you ever wondered and asked yourself, why do I love God so much? But- <laughs> no, my, my big question is, man, why do I keep sinning and showing that I don't love him? But it doesn't seem to be working. How do I get a divine reversal for me and my family? Get a divine reversal? How do I get me one of them divine reversals? Family, because this is a... Isn't the cross the ultimate divine reversal? Excuse me, but the the gospel, the biblical gospel, the one she's not preaching, tells us of the like the ultimate divine reversal because each and every one of us is born dead in trespasses and sins and heading to hell. But the divine reversal is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's trespasses against them. You know, the idea is that, uh, that uh, God made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. That's the divine reversal. Here she's talking about, you know, hey, you know, are you having financial problem? Would you like a divine reversal? Well, you need to break those generational curses is what you need to do by exercising your exousia. About generational blessing. Have you ever wondered why you love God, but your life is not working for you, for your family, your finances? Remember, this is about generational blessings. Uh huh. Yeah, you haven't even shown a, a coherent, single, lucid verse in context to demonstrate this teaching is actually what the Bible reveals. It's about your family, about your seed as well. The decisions you make today don't only impact you, but they impact all those that you love, all those that you will produce, all those that are in your lineage, your succession. Let's examine a deeper look at Deuteronomy. Okay, we're going to stop there. We'll pick this up tomorrow, but you kind of get the taste of what it is that she does. She is really good at this, and that ain't good, but she is extremely gifted in her ability to just rattle off all of these verses and passages out of context to create the impression that the, the Bible teaches that, you know, you got to learn how to exercise your exousia so, with your words so that you can bring heaven in alignment with you and experience a divine reversal. Boy, she, she I mean, no blushing, no, I mean, just absolutely no conscience whatsoever regarding all of her Bible twisting. But there it is. And she does in such a, you, you got to think about your grandchildren here. Don't you care about them? You see, Pastor Pastrix Paula, she's going to tell you what none of your pastors are telling you, but she, and she, and it's only because she cares about your yet-to-be-born grandchildren. You know, I mean, this she, this is just so selfless on her part. <clears throat> yeah, excuse me, I, I I've learned that you have to cough three times once for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit whenever you hear something like this. Well, hang on. <clears throat> So there we go. All right, uh, we are up on our second break. If you'd like to email me regarding anything you've heard on this edition or any previous editions of Fighting for the Faith, you can do so. My email address is talkback at fightingforthefaith.com, or you can subscribe on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash pirate Christian, or follow me on Twitter. My name there, at pirate Christian. Other side of the break, sermon review from CB Glades, from one of the young pups in the seeker driven movement. You know, get your crash helmet, you'll need it. We'll be right back. No itching ears are scratched here. You're listening to Fighting for the Faith. Pirate Christian Radio Theater presents Death of a Salesman. Are ye a salesman? Why, yes, I am. Can I interest you in some... Okay, well, yesterday we did part one of our two-part little series here on debunking Paula White's false teaching regarding so-called generational curses. Now, I'm going to build on the foundation that we laid yesterday, and you're going to find that as we begin today's installment, that uh, that Paula White is going to make reference to uh, that uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, blessing and cursing. This is not to be redundant. This is just where we cut it. And it you know, kind of builds off of yesterday. But when we went back yesterday 
and looked at the passages that she was quoting regarding these so-called generational curses, um, she was not quoting anything in context. And here's the idea, is that false teachers, and you know, not only did they add to Scripture or take away from it and subtract from it, but the other thing that they do is they will their doctrines can't actually be found in any clear passage. So and the only way that you can get their doctrines is by basically ripping a verse out of context here, stringing it with this verse that's been ripped out of context from over there, and then snatching that one from way over there, and then stringing them all together as if they all hang together in some kind of a coherent way. And then the idea then is is that it's the narrative that's you know that the false teacher is giving as they're stringing these verses along out of context. That is is where their teaching is. It's actually not found in the Bible itself. For instance, okay, how do you know that, um, you know, what would I say? Okay, here's the idea. How would you know that Jesus is God? Now, a few weeks ago or a while ago, I actually did an entire segment where we went through the different passages that clearly say that Jesus is none other than God in human flesh, okay? And you'll notice that the teaching itself regarding the deity of Christ was in the the clear language of those passages. It was not ambiguous. It said that Jesus, even though by na- he is by nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, things like that, or great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So the idea of the deity of Christ is established based upon clear teaching, and the, the doctrine itself can be found in the grammar, in the text themselves. False teachers, their doctrines can't actually be found in the grammar, in the words themselves of Scripture. So, because you know, it it's not sound doctrine; it's false doctrine. So, what they do is is that they they'll rip these verses out of context, of completely pour new meaning into these passages, and then tell you, you know, this narrative that 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 explains the theology that supposedly connects all of these passages together. But you can't go to a verse that says any of the things they're saying. For instance, yesterday, Paula White was talking about how you need to take authority with your words and break generational curses. But you can't find a single passage of Scripture where God said, you need to take authority with your words and use your words to break generational curses. The reason why you will never find a verse that says that is because it's not what the Bible says teaches. And Paula White is just a very, very skilled veteran at twisting the Bible and teaching theology and doctrines that are not actually found in Scripture. You can't, so many of the things that she makes claim to, you can't actually go and into the Bible and find what she's saying there. That's the danger of it. So that's where we're going to, you know, that's kind of the setup for today's installment of this and, and, the, and pay close attention to what she's doing. She's going to literally, we're going from Deuteronomy to Job to Proverbs to Romans, and over and again, the theology is not in the Bible passages, it's in her narrative as she's stringing them together. So here we go, here's Paula White. Have you ever wondered why you love God, but your life is not working? For you, for your family, your finances. Remember, this is about generational blessings. It's about your family, about your seed as well. The decisions you make today don't only impact you, but they impact all those that you love, all those that you will produce, all those that are in your lineage, your succession. Let's examine a deeper look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. It says that blessing and cursing is set before you. Blessing is from the Hebrew word B-A-W-R-A-K, Barak. And and we often think of it as to kneel in adoration towards God. That is one definition. But the other part of that is the benefits and the blessing that is given by God to man. So when he's saying choose blessing, he's saying choose the benefits, the goodness, the favor. That's what it breaks down. Okay, now notice what she's doing here. Yesterday, on on yesterday's edition of Fighting for the Faith, we put Deuteronomy 30 back in context and showed that this has nothing to do with breaking generational curses. And yet she's taken the time to try to figure out what the Hebrew word for blessing is and what the Hebrew word for cursing is 
as if somehow Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19 is teaching us that we that the the future our future depends on our ability to bless or curse with our words yet the passage doesn't say that it doesn't say it at all okay the theology that she's teaching is not a biblical theology it's a theology of her own making and it's not found in scripture it's found in the words she's saying so just because you can say oh well deuteronomy chapter um uh 30 verse 19 gives us the word for blessing and cursing it doesn't mean anything doesn't mean anything what does the passage say in context and when you look at it back in context, it doesn't say anything she's making it, trying to make it say. To the goodness of God given to man by God. Curse, on the other hand, in the Hebrew is K-E-L-A-W-L-A-W. You know I'm not even going to try to pronounce these, but it means villain. Yeah, it's, it's kalala. It's kal- that's the, the Hebrew word for curse. But so what? This passage isn't teaching that we can create blessings or curses using our words. That's not what this text is saying at all. Vilification. To vilify means to lower in the estimation or the importance. It means to utter slanderous and abusive statements against. It means to defame. So here is what's important. If you choose blessing, you choose the benefits of the goodness of God given to you. If you choose cursing, you are choosing to be lowered in estimation and value. You're choosing to be slandered because remember, either heaven or hell are coming in agreement with you. And if two. Yeah, again, either heaven or hell are coming in agreement with you. Again, what passages in the scripture teach this doctrine clearly? In the grammar itself, uh, in the words of the Bible? Answer there isn't a passage that teaches any of this. There's a reason why this doctrine hasn't appeared until recently in church history. The reason why is because this is not a biblical teaching. You agree is touching anything, it will come to pass. You're, you're choosing to be defamed. The main vehicles for curses and for blessing is words. Now it's not... Okay, again, um, where does the Bible say that the main vehicle for blessings or curses is words? Answer, it doesn't. And this is kind of the pivotal part where you got to pay attention to what she's doing here. She has made an assertion. The main vehicle for blessings or curses, those are words. And so she's asserted this without actually teaching it from Scripture. And now she's going to go and she's going to selectively find proof texts that mention something to do with your words or your tongue as if they validate the assertion that she's made, but they don't. They don't teach it at all. In fact, the way she presents them, they assume her the. She quotes them out of context, assuming that they are that they are in agreement with her theology. But there isn't a passage that actually says what she just said. Not the only vehicle. I'm going to co- cover others, but the main vehicle. That's why Job said, "I spoke against myself in the weariness of my own soul." And often we speak against ourselves because the thing. <laughs> That's, she just said, see, that's the reason why Job said, I spoke against myself in the weariness of my own soul. She's, she's referencing uh, Job chapter 10, verse 1. But when you put it back in context, that's not the reason why Job said those words. It's not the reason at all. Let's take a look at the context. Job chapter 10, verse 1 is what she's referencing. Let's put it in context, and we'll go to Job chapter 9, starting at verse 20, 20, uh, 27. If I say I will forget my complaint, I will put off my sad face and be of good cheer. I become afraid of all my suffering, for I know you will not hold me innocent. I shall be condemned. Why then do I labor in vain? If I wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye, yet you will plunge me into a pit, and my own clothes will abhor me. For he is not a man as I am that I might answer him that we should come to trial together. There is no arbiter between us who might lay his hand on both of us. Let him take his rod away from me and let not dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak without fear of him for I am not, I am not so in myself. I loathe my life. I will give free utterance to my complaint. 
I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me. Let me know why you contend against me. Does it seem good to you to oppress, to despise the work of your hands and favor the designs of the wicked? Have you eyes of flesh? Do you see as a man sees? Are your days as the days of man? Are your years as a man's years that you seek out my iniquity and search for my sin, although you know that I am not guilty and there is none to deliver out of your hand? You fashioned and made me, and now you have destroyed me altogether. Now, this is important, okay? When you look at the entire story of Job, what was the reason why Job experienced the destruction that he experienced? Was it because he cursed his life with his words? Not at all. No, the reason Job went through what Job went through is because God and Satan um, were basically um, having a showdown, okay? Uh, Satan wanted to sift him, you know, believe that God was protecting him, and Satan believed that uh, that Job would curse God to his face if God stopped blessing him. So the reason why Job experienced all of this stuff is not because Job said words that cursed his life or that he was blessed because he said words that brought blessing to his life and broke generational curses. Nothing of the sort. That has nothing to do with what he's talking about here because when you read the story of Job, you realize that what befell him uh, had nothing to do with his words or cursing or things like that. So what Paula White is doing here, again, she's taking these verses out of context and stringing them together, and her theology is in the narrative between the quotations of the verses, but the theology she's preaching can't be found in Scripture when you put... When you search for it, you, know, you, can, you won't be able to find a single passage that says any of the things that she's saying. We continue. The thing that we fear the most will come upon us. Proverbs 11, 9 says, A hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor, but through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Proverbs. Now, point this out here. Proverbs 11, 9. With his mouth, a godless man would destroy his neighbor. Does that, is this, is Proverbs 11, 9 teaching that, you know, if you say a curse, you know, using words that all of a sudden destruction will happen to your neighbor? Nope. That's not what this passage is saying at all. A godless man can destroy his neighbor with his mouth by what? Lying against his neighbor, gossiping against his neighbor, slandering in his neighbor, things like that. That's how a godless man would destroy his neighbor, not by because there's power of blessing and cursing in his mouth. Proverbs 11.9 is not talking about that at all. But notice here that, but by knowledge, the righteous are delivered. It doesn't say by blessing with your tongue are the righteous delivered. No, it says by knowledge. You get it? We continue. 15.4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Okay, now she's found another verse out of context. Proverbs 15.4. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness, uh, perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Okay, what's this talking about again? Is it talking about magical properties of cursing and, and blessing? No. This is talking about perverseness in the sense of speaking lies, slandering, not telling the truth, gossiping, tearing somebody down, that kind of stuff that people do with their tongues. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now, now this is an oft quoted uh, passage by these types of teachers. Death and life are in the power of the tongue as if somehow there's magical properties of death and life and but that's not what the saying at all. Again, this is consistent with all the other passages in Proverbs that talk about how basically using your tongue to speak evil, to lie of your neighbor, slander him, tear down, disclose his secrets, things like that, tear, you know, destroys somebody's life. That's what's talking, that's what's being discussed here again in Proverbs 18:21 and when you look at it, it's clearly not saying that there's magical properties of life and death in your tongue and you have to speak life or you know, speak words that are in agreement with, uh, with, with heaven so that you have blessings or if you speak the death over yourself, the curses will come your way. That's not what this passage is saying at all. You just need to look at it in the, in the overall context of what's going on in Proverbs. But every single one of these verses ripped from context, none of them say or teach the theology that she's teaching. And there's no clear passage that says the things that she's saying. Now, here is what's so important. 
It is critical that we line our mouth up and I'll continue with scripture because the apostle James is going to come back and say, if we can't control our tongue, our whole spiritual experience with God, our religion is in vain, that, that it's, it's utterly useless. So we're going to understand that there's so much power in the tongue, but here's the key. The key. No, it's again, there's so much power in the tongue. She's talking like as if the tongue has magical properties or miraculous pro No, that's not what is being discussed here. Very natural understanding here being taught even in James. He is not getting the tongue to speak, but the ear to hear. If you can hear right now by the Spirit of God. But what? What God is saying to you, that you're not a victim to life, that you're not a victim to circumstance, that I don't care where... What? If I can hear what the Spirit is saying to me, that I'm not a victim of life or circumstance, what are you talking about? There's no passage that teaches any of this. Where you've been and what you've gone through, how many people in your family have carried down through the sins of your forefather, because I'm going to teach you the difference between transgression, sin, iniquity, and how Jesus Christ came to give a divine exchange to remove all of that from you and your family. No matter what has been passed down, yes, your words ultimately change it because you can't even get saved without words. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that he's the Son of God, you'll be saved. To confess with your mouth literally means to make a covenant with your mouth. No, that is not true at all. The Greek word there is homologeo, which means to say the same thing. It's a confession to say the same thing as God. Yeah, I'm guilty. You know, that I'm guilty of being a sinner and I confess you to be Lord and Christ and things like that. Let's take a look at Romans chapter uh, 10 real quick here. And to put this back in context so you can see what's really going on here. Romans chapter 10. Okay, <clears throat> starting at verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness that is based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to take uh, bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. That means to be declared righteous. So this verse 10 clearly says that you are saved or justified when you believe, and with the mouth one confesses is saved. So the idea is what's out, what's in your heart, your belief in your heart springs forth words that confess that Jesus is Lord. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Notice that in this passage that confessing and believing are practically synonyms because they go hand in hand. If you've been regenerated, if you've been born from above, then, you know, you will confess Lord the Lord with your mouth because you already believe him to be Lord in your heart. That's what this text is saying. It has nothing to do with teaching a special uh, principle regarding the power of saying words. That's not what's going on here at all. Every time you speak, you're making a covenant. But here's the key. Are you speaking? No. By the way, I got to challenge that again. Flag on the play. No. Every time you speak, you are not making a covenant because the word for confess here is not to make a covenant. Hamalagao means to say the same thing. That's what this. T that's uh, man. She just she she just rattles these you know assertions off like machine gun style, and they're hard to catch some of them because it happens so fast. But no. Every time you speak, you are not making a covenant. There is no Bible passage that says that. What the Spirit is saying. This is so vital because it doesn't just impact you, but it impacts your children, your children's children. And according to the Word, you have the ability or the authority, as I've already taught you through the Word. Yeah, we've already explained how you totally hijacked the word exousia and basically just told us what the Greek word exousia means and then made all these assertions based on the definition without any passages that say any of the things that you were saying. You have the authority to reverse that curse because of the... No, you don't. 
that's the price that Jesus paid. He became a curse that you might receive the blessing of the Lord. Now, as we've studied, we found out that the main vehicle, it's not the only one, and I'll teach you more, but the main vehicle for releasing blessings and cursing are words. Our words according to Proverbs chapter 18, have the power of life and death. No, they don't, because when you look at it in context with what's going on in that passage, it's not saying that our, our words are magical things that have the power of life and death. And so when we begin to speak, either heaven is coming in agreement or hell is coming in agreement. No, there isn't a passage that says this. Because we have authority that has been given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, because we have authority. Yeah, again, you never proved that yesterday. That's why Job said, in the weariness of my soul, I spoke against my... No, that's not why Job said that, because when you understand the details of the book of Job, they don't jive with your theology here. Myself. The worst thing that we can do is speak against ourselves. The big... Oh, give me a break. The biggest enemy is not on the outside. It's on the inside. Because all... Don't say bad words about yourself or bad things might happen to you. A, a house might fall on your head. Ultimately, what I believe about myself, what I believe about what God's word has to say about me, has more influence and power and authority than what anyone else is saying against me. This is just flat out magic narcissism. Those words can be broken by the blood of Jesus. And I'm going to show you how. Oh, give me a break. Now, now James points this out and uses such vivid imagery as he begins to show us in James chapter 3, verse 5 through 10. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter. A Notice when you read James 3 in context, it's not teaching any of the magical principles regarding your words that Paula has been telling us about. A little fire kindleth, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body. Watch what he's saying. If you can't control your tongue, it defiles, corrupts, ruins, spoils, wastes. That's what that word means. The entire body. And set <sighs> Good night. setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue no man can tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Right, exactly. And your false teaching here is an example of how the tongue is an, you know, full of deadly poison. You are literally speaking words of death by teaching false doctrine and things you ought not to teach. You're not engaging in exegesis. You're you're engaging in Bible twisting by ripping all of these passages out of context and then weaving them together in a tapestry of deceit. This, is, In fact, James is warning about the kind of thing that you're doing right now. Therewith we bless God, even the Father, and therewith we curse men, which are made after the similitude of God. Now, verse 10 is where it's so important. Out of the same mouth, proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. So James here again emphasizes the tremendous power. Yeah, when you look at James in context, he's not talking about power in the magic sense that you're discussing. This has to do with how you use your tongue to, on the one hand, praise God and bless the Lord, and then this, in the next moment, you're gossiping, slandering, lying, backbiting, and tearing somebody down with that same mouth. That's what he's talking about. That words have to affect people. Let me show you. Your father said you're stupid. And so now you're sitting here on your third degree. You've got two masters, your bachelor, but you truly believe you're stupid. Your first boyfriend called you ugly. So you've been through a myriad of... This is ridiculous. Men, but you believe you are... So do you think that Jesus died on the cross to break the curse of somebody calling you ugly? Unbelievable. The way you break that curse, by the way, it's real simple. You forgive as you've been forgiven. When somebody hurts you and slanders you and says false things about you or tears you down... It's not that you break their words by going, I bind those words and I break that curse by the blood of Jesus or anything. No, 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 no. They've sinned against you. You forgive them just as you've been forgiven in Christ for the sins that you've committed. That's 
how the curse has been broken, is that God you know, broke it for us by becoming a curse for us on the cross and dying for our sins so that we can be forgiven. That's why we pray in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Notice she makes references to the blood of Christ. She's not teaching you to forgive as you've been forgiven, but instead engage in magic. Oh, your tongue has the power to break curses, so you break that curse in the name of Jesus by the blood of Jesus and da-da-da-da-da. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. You're ugly. Your mother said you'll never amount to anything. You believe that you are worthless, that you have no value. Now, take into consideration the fact that God said you're the apple of his eye. God what? Really? Unbelievable. God says you're... Yeah, by the way, it was Jesus. When he came out of the waters of the Jordan River after being baptized by John the Baptist, the voice of the Father said, that you are my son in whom I am well pleased. He has not said that to me, and he has not said that to you. We are made pleasing before God by the shed blood of Christ. We are not the apple of God's eye, according to Jesus... We are all born children of the devil, dead in trespasses and sins. This is a dangerous teaching. Not only is it magic, not sound theology, it's narcissistic to the hilt. Fearfully and wonderfully created in his image. That God says you can do all things through Christ Jesus. That God says in James 1, 8, that you have the wisdom of God. And if any man lack wisdom, let him ask. Him. Notice that this is Joel Osteen's teaching too. You know, stand in front of the mirror and declare affirmations about yourself. Yeah, this is, this is the word of faith heresy. You create reality with your words, both either negative or positive. This isn't biblical theology at all. In fact, this is the kind of narcissistic nonsense that leads people to hell. All right, we're up on our second break. If you'd like to email me regarding anything you've heard on this edition or any previous editions of Fighting for the Faith, you can do so. My email address is talkback at fightingforthefaith.com or you can subscribe on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash pirate Christian or follow me on Twitter, my name there, at pirate Christian. We will be right back. Two good sermons to end off the week and our year here at Fighting for the Faith. Don't want to miss it. We'll be right back. We don't need to rethink Christianity. We need to rediscover it. You're listening to Fighting for the Faith. Hi, Rich Christian Radio Theater presents Death of a Salesman. Are ye a salesman? Why, yes, I am. Can I interest you in some... <laughs> Listening to Byron. 